Hello, I'm Kevin Rank, first year gastroenterology fellow at the University of Minnesota. And my name is Rima Malik. I'm a surgical resident here at the University of Minnesota. On behalf of our co-authors, we'd like to thank the editors of GIE for, for providing us this wonderful opportunity to, prevent, to present the findings of our paper, Single Session Laparoscopic Cholecystectomy and ERCP, a valid option for the management of cholelithiasis. Our co-authors for this study are uh, uh, Carrie Ronstrom, Stuart Amato, Mustafa Arain, Rajiv Atom, Martin Freeman, and James Harmon, all from the University of Minnesota here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So Kevin, cholelithiasis is present in up to 20% of patients undergoing cholecystectomy, and while although a third of patients may ultimately clear the duct spontaneously uh, within a six-week time frame, the complications um, sustained from routine common bile duct stones can be quite severe, you know, necrotizing pancreatitis, um, ascending cholangitis. So given this, we generally recommend to diagnose and treat um, cholelithiasis in conjunction with performing a cholecystectomy. So a number of options exist for duct clearance, including preoperative and postoperative ERCP, as well as intraoperative common bile duct exploration. Um, to date, however, the option for ERCP uh, immediately after cholecystectomy has been omitted um, from most major guidelines as far as performing this in the same operative session. At our institution, given the immediate proximity of ERCP rooms and a collaborative approach between our surgeons and advanced endoscopists, however, the option um, for a immediate ERCP following cholecystectomy became a viable option and has been performed at our institution for several years. In this study, we sought to report on the technical aspects, success rates, and several key metrics and patient outcomes from this approach. With regards to the study's methodology, the a study was approved by our, ins our institution's IRB and patients included for the study were all greater than 16 years old who both underwent ERCP and lap laparoscopic cholecystectomy in a 30-day period. 254 patients met this initial criteria with 68 from the single session and 186 from separate sessions. Patients with ruin Y gastric bypass, uh, indication of bile leak, or patients that have either had either previous sphincterotomy or suspicion for alternate pathology such as malignancy were subsequently excluded from the study. And following the exclusion of these patients, so regarding the technical aspects of tandem procedure success, it was preferred to perform the laparoscopic cholecystectomy first due to concerns for over-insufflation, limiting adequate surgical exposure. Although it's important to note that persistent dilation of the bowel is likely limited by use of carbon dioxide for ERCP. ERCP was generally performed in the same fluoroscopy compatible table as the laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And generally, the ERCP was performed in a supine position although it was very simple and very easy to convert the patient to a prone position should it be needed for facilitation of the ERCP. So key points investigated included ASA score, preoperative laboratory investigations and their values, imaging studies and their results, the length of hospitalization, and post-procedural complications, if any. Endoscopic and operative reports were reviewed directly to assess for ERCP findings and procedural details such as total anesthetic and operating room time, the single and separate session cohorts were similar with uh, regards to age, sex, and ASA scores. It is worth noting that abnormalities in preoperative liver function tests and the presence of clinical pancreatitis was higher in the separate session course, uh, likely reflecting the inability to perform immediate cholecystectomy in the setting of acute gallstone pancreatitis, and that rates of preoperative imaging were lower in the single session group, perhaps reflecting the high pretest probability that was present for cholecystectomy in this setting. ERCP was successful in 198% of uh, uh, the single and separate session uh, cohorts, respectively, both for CBD cannulation and clearance. Uh, rates of biliary stent placement were higher in the separate session cohort, reflecting a concern for recurrence. Rates of protective pancreatic stent placement were similar in both cohorts. No post-ERCP pancreatitis, bleeding, or perforation was seen. There was no mortality seen in either group. The rates of adverse events were similarly low in both cohorts as well. And there was no difference in me between mean procedure time or total duration of anesthesia, although there was a trend towards uh, decreased uh, total anesthetic time in the single session group. The average length of stay following the cholecystectomy was the same in both groups, but the overall length of the hospitalization was significantly shorter in those undergoing lab co ERCP in a single session, a reflection that patients who had simultaneous procedures were more likely to receive their cholecystectomy earlier in the hospitalization. It's worth noting as well that this effect persisted even when adjusting for patients with cholangitis and pancreatitis. There's also a, tr cost, a trend towards cost savings in the simultaneous procedure cohort, although this difference was not statistically significant. All right, so there are several treatment options for the um, therapy of concurrent common bile duct stones in the setting of cholecystitis, 
But to date, most major guidelines exclude the option of simultaneous cholecystectomy and ERCP in one operative setting. The possibility of performing both procedures simultaneously is appealing for several reasons, including reduction in the number of total procedures for a patient, reduction in, t in total induction anesthesia, and the ability to perform IOC um, pre procedurally to limit the number of speculative ERCPs. An additional benefit is the possibility to aid in cannulation of the bile duct via transcystic wire passage during the laparoscopic cholecystectomy in the setting of particularly challenging anatomy. A key feature of this process at our institution is that both procedures are performed in one single operating suite, so the patient isn't moved, is left on a fluoroscopy-ready table, which is um, easily able to facilitate an ERCP. The only thing that's switched is the providers. Um, a key feature to that, really, in being able to do that is getting preoperative consent for an ERCP should it be found to be necessary. There are a few additional points that I think uh, warrant some merit in discussion further. Uh, the rates of pancreatitis in both cohorts were very low, uh, perhaps due to the uh, higher rates of protective pancreatic stent placement, where between a quarter and a third of all patients. Uh, it's worth noting that um, the uh, use of rectal enamethacin was only present for the last four months of our study period. In a recent study published by Tim Gardner, uh, there doesn't appear to be any difference in the uh, rates of post-ERCP pancreatitis in average risk individuals with the use of rectal enamethacin. So we acknowledge that there are some limitations to our study. Certainly not all patients are candidates for a um, single session approach, particularly those who have acute pancreatitis, um, ascending cholangitis who may need an ERCP done more in an emergent setting. Um, a limiting factor to this, um, the, the generalizability of this process is really availability of resources at smaller institutions. We're very fortunate in our institution for there to be specific OR suites which are well equipped for ERCPs to really facilitate a, you know, a quick, um, quick turnover. Um, but we recognize that these resources and the ability to coordinate such a large block. Despite these limitations, I think that overall um, the study's results do show that uh, single session ERCP and cholecystectomy is an effective and um, efficient way of managing uh, concurrent cholelithiasis and cholecystitis. Additionally, I think that despite the fact that we're a large uh, tertiary referral center, our patient population in general is a very generalizable one. Um, these patients were all virgin papilla with the presence of cholelithiasis and a number of um, conditions that would generally require a referral for a, to a tertiary center were um, a part of our initial exclusion criteria. And so the, the cohort of patients that we're left with um, were, I think, very average risk and um, very approachable for in a community setting as well. So in summary, you know, the thing about our study is it does show that simultaneous cholecystectomy and ERCP is safe, it's feasible, there's no increase in morbidity nor mortality or postoperative complications in general, and it decreases length of hospitalization, which is important um, for patients anywhere, really. Um, I think, again, um, you know, with the increasing the amounts of separate pr uh, procedures being performed in an outpatient setting, um, had the cholecystectomies in the separate session been performed in an inpatient setting, um, the cost difference may become statistically significant as well. And as we move more towards a bundled payment model, this may become uh, more part of a financial incentive for practices to perform this procedure as well. Uh, so in summary, this procedure appears to be safe, effective, and readily um, applicable to a lot of community settings as well. Um, so Dr. Mallon, thank you. Thank you very Pleasure much, Dr. With you. <laughs> and I'm going to photobomb here. This is Marty Freeman. <laughs> I want to say what a great job these guys have done in uh, conducting the study and how graceful they are in the, in, uh, on camera. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>